Okay, hi guys, and welcome to the show. And today I am reviewing the new, well, new for 2018, the Navitimer One, and this is the 38 millimeter uh, new incarnation of the Navitimer. But fear not, there are a ton of variations. It's um, not all without a chronograph, so, you know, um, don't get your knickers in a twist just yet. It is a, quite an interesting piece. And I've got to give a massive shout out to Moya Jewelers, who are an authorized dealer for Brightening and uh, so graciously lent this little stunner in for review. So shout out to Derek and um, thank you so much for making this possible. Now I've also included my Navi Timer. As you guys know, I am a huge, huge Navi Timer fan. It's my favorite chronograph, I know. Uh, bold statement, but um, honestly, I really do mean it. And before I forget, I'll do a quick wristwatch check before we get into this. I'm wearing the Laurier, fantastic micro brand diver, 39 millimeter. I have reviewed that as well. Uh, also vintage inspired. So before we commence with the review and go through all the uh, dimensions, all the rest of it, the specifications, uh, let's just have an overview of the history of the Navi Timer to really give this uh, review some context. So the Breitling Navi Timer is not only one of the most legendary aviation watches of all time, it is a watch that is inextricably linked to the history of chronographs. The Breitling Navi Timer is a chronograph with an integrated flight computer which will turn 70 in uh, just a few years. So where did the story start? Well, the Breitling Navitimer is an evolution of the 1942 Breitling Chronomat uh, with its typical slide rule bezel. The 1942 Chronomat came with an outsourced movement and this was a Venus 176. Breitling decided to improve on the practical bezel in 1952 with the release of the Navi. This slide rule bezel was used to calculate complicated operations uh, without any other tool. It was long used by the United States Air Force and this very much cemented the brand's dedication to pilots. This rotating bezel around the periphery of the Navi timer, a calculation tool that we got to remember this is a pre-electronic calculator world. Uh, metric to standard conversions, fuel consumption, airspeed, distance calculation, uh, and more. But at the same time, you can still use it to uh, calculate the tip on a bill, for example. But beyond the birth of the Breitling Navi Timer in 1952, the history of the Navi Timer really starts with the origins of Breitling, the brand itself. In 1884, the 24-year-old Leon Breitling, who was already a trained watchmaker, arrived in Saint-Amier to create his first chronograph. That year is also considered the first official founding year of Breitling. In 1892, the young company moved to Le Champ de Fonds and produced chronograph pocket watches under the name G. Leon Breitling S.A. Mont Brillant. Within a few years, Breitling had seen an increase in demand for military chronographs as well. In 1915, Breitling introduced the first wrist chronograph with central seconds and a 30-minute counter allowing pilots to achieve basic calculations. The first chronograph with a pusher, usually start and reset of the chronograph was made through the crown. So this was very much a brightening first. And this very much is the origins of what was to become the brand's main genre of watch. In 1934, Willie Breitling, the successor of Lyon, came up with an idea that has now become the norm. Uh, for chronographs, and that is adding two pushes. So one to stop and start, and the other uh, to reset timing. Willie wanted to go further in the idea of a calculation tool and asked the mathematician Marcel Robert to create a slide rule bezel that could perform complex logarithmic calculations. He created a scale with the three most important units for pilots, STAT for standard mileage, KM for kilometers 
kilometers and NAUT for nautical miles. So this essentially was the first on the wrist computer. Bizarre to think that looking back now, but uh, again, I must repeat that this is a pre-digital world. So fast forward back to 1952, the very first Navitimer adorned with Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association or AOPA, uh, the typical double winged logo. And by 1960, a real cooperation with the AOPA began. The Navitimer name was the contraction of navigation and obviously timer. The first edition to be sold was the reference 806, powered by the manual column wheel mechanism chronograph movement of the Venus 178. These early specimens are now extremely collectible. The stainless steel versions are amongst the easiest to find, but also the most sought after. Uh, there later was gold-plated editions, uh, which are less popular, and there are even a few solid 18 karat gold versions, uh, unquestionably the most expensive. There were even a few 806s that were equipped with the Valju 72, which we all know from the previous Daytona video was used in a few of the Rolexes. During the late 50s, the brand uh, started to use what is commonplace nowadays, and that is more of an emphasis on marketing and ambassadors. Willie Breitling helped the Swiss advertiser Georges Caspari to develop a campaign targeting groups of pilots, and uh, this created huge demand for the, these navigation chronographs. Furthermore, Breitling continued to be the official supplier of onboard instruments for all the major aircraft companies. Uh, for example, if we look at the 1957 Boeing 747, uh, these were equipped with Breitling dashboard instruments. In 1962, a special edition of the Navitimer, the Cosmonaut, with a 24-hour display, accompanied the astronaut Scott Carpenter to space. So not only does the Navitimer, as an iconic watch, predate perhaps its one of its greatest rivals, the Speedmaster, it has also earned a place in the short but prestigious list of watches and chronographs that have been used in space exploration. The 60s was very much the peak of the Navi timer, but it also started to become popular culturally with the likes of my personal favorite, Miles Davis, being a big wearer of the watch itself. One even popped up in the James Bond Thunderball movie in 1965, one of two Breitlings in that movie. The bizarrely modded Breitling top time that uh, Sean Connery wears often gets the limelight, but we forget that the character of Captain Derville, a French NATO pilot, wore a reference 806. This fascination with the Navi timer has persevered over the decades, with such fans as Travolta, Tommy Lee Jones, Serge Gainsbourg, the legendary musician uh, Herbie Hancock, Seinfeld, and so on and so forth. So by the end of the 60s, Breitling chose to change from the Venus 178 to the Valju 7740, a manually wound movement cam operated with a date feature. And then finally, the first introduction of an automatic chronograph came in 1969, and this is perhaps one of the most interesting uh, developments for the Navitimer. The man behind this new caliber was uh, Gerard de Bouy, who's now become famous with the name de Bois de Brie, and we've mentioned him in various um, reviews of Speedmaster automatics and etc. Uh, using a base caliber from Buren, um, who themselves are famous for their micro rotor, again recently mentioned. Uh, Dubuis started working with Jack Hoyer and Willie Breitling to develop a brand new idea for an automatic chronograph. And it's this cooperation that led to the creation of a modular chronograph mechanism that was added onto the top of a Buren caliber. And this incorporated the micro rotor, which is um, pretty much invisible uh, if you look at the movement. And so the legendary caliber 11 was born. This is a, an extremely unique movement because also it features a left positioned crown and the pushes are at the usual position located at the right. The introduction of this movement changed massively the face of the Navi timer to a bicompact with the date at the six, which is a massive 48 millimeter watch. And this is the reference 1806. 
Now, Breitling subsequently, in much later decades, became synonymous with big, big watches, but this was way ahead of that, and even for the 70s was absolutely massive. Now, inevitably, during the 70s, the Swiss faced the quartz crisis. Affordable, accurate quartzes from Japan were dominating the market, the Swiss were really hurting. Breitling had to um, adapt. They introduced the quartz and LCD versions of the Navi timer, but unfortunately to no avail and sales continued to decrease. By the late 70s, Willie Breitling had no other choice but inevitably close the company and sell it. In 1978, Ernest Schneider, who was himself an avid pilot and who came from a watch manufacturing background, bought Breitling and moved it to Gretchen. But something really interesting happened during these dark times, and you'll probably remember this from my review of the Zin 903. During this period, it was possible to buy Navi timers without the Breitling logo. Now, this was because Helmut Zinn, who had already started his own German manufacturing company, bought the rights to the watch and nearly the entire stock of spare parts, which Breitling sold. So Helmut Zinn was able to um, legally create his own version of the Navi timer. By the 1990s, mechanical watches had seen a bit of a comeback and gained renewed interest uh, from consumers. And so the Navi timer came back. There was, of course, uh, any digi versions like the Jupiter Navi timers. Also, we must not forget that in the early days of the aerospace, if you watched my previous video on my chronospace, some of them actually had Navi timer on the dial before they evolved into their own distinctive line of watches. These newer reissued navvies were reworked, reintroduced with the Valdru 7750, the most known and used automatic chronograph movement in the world. Several editions were introduced, such as the Airborne, with its four sub-counters. One was added at the 12th for the date. The old navvy timer, the closest to the original 806, with the reverse panda, three dials. Many historical editions were launched as well. And then finally, perhaps the most important year for Breitling's history, in 2009, they introduced a fully in-house movement. This, of course, is the Breitling 01. This automatic chronograph movement comes with an integrated architecture, uh, so there were no modules added like the Caliber 11. It also featured the column wheel mechanism and was chronometer certified, which became standard on all Breitling watches since 1999. For the 60th anniversary in 2012, Breitling came out with a 500-piece limited edition. Uh, this featured the dark blue sky dial, the in-house movement, and a see-through case back. In 2014, uh, in probably the height of the larger watch trend, which some could arguably say was Breitling's influence, the Navi Timer 01 appeared at Basel in an even larger case, expanding from 42 millimeters to 46 for the classical edition, and there was an even larger 48 millimeter GMT edition. And then in 2017, the Navi Timer reintroduced the Rattrapanto, Rattrapante complication. So this split second chronograph, uh, which I have reviewed, uh, by the way, featured the caliber B03, uh, again, automatic chronometer certified, and was entirely all in-house. Very, very impressive. But more recently, within the last year, probably the most drastic change for the Navi timer occurred. In the late months of 2017, George Kern took the helm and made some rather dramatic changes, not only to the Breitling Navi timer line, but to the whole brand itself. So here we are back in 2018. Now, there are three versions of this available. There is a black dial with stainless steel. There's a blue dial, which is the one you see before you. And then finally, there's a cream dial in steel and I think it's rose gold. They either come on a bracelet like this, which uh, is your typical uh, brightening bracelet with that very um, distinctive six link. I love the fluidity of these. These are really beautiful bracelets. Solid end links, of course. The only um, drawback of these 
you get a signed fold over and it's just a bog standard clasp. Unfortunately, you don't get any micro adjustments, but the links, if uh, this thing will ever focus, there we go, the links are screwed links. Um, the quality of these is exceptional, completely high polished, quite uh, not blingy, I think that's not the right word, but they do have an incredible mirror finish that uh, is quite dazzling to behold. But anyway, um, I'm wearing it on the strap, which is another option you can have. Uh, I just think it's, um, well, I didn't want to um, scratch up the bracelet. I have to say the, the, the straps that Breitling do are absolutely fantastic, very thick and substantial. They, they taper towards the edge. We have the white stitching to complement the, the scales there. It's a very dark, luscious royal blue, slightly different uh, hue to the actual dial, which we'll discuss in just a second. But yeah, fantastic. S um, simple uh, pin and buckle there, which does have, interestingly, the winged logo. So let's just get the basic specifications out of the way. The, the entire case is stainless steel. Again, uh, high polish. We do get a screwed scalloped edge. Not a, not a very... Um, detailed engraving but not as involved as as on my navi there but um which does have the, have the scales i always did like that so let's just get the dimensions out of the way first so the diameter is 38 millimeters although i have to say the edge of the bezel there it juts out a little bit so it's even smaller actually it's a smidgen under 10 millimeters tall lug to lug is 44 and with a 20 millimeter lug width. So yes, a very, very diminutive scale, especially for Breitling. Um, but of course, as we all know, Breitling's under new leadership, and this was designed to bring in a whole new uh, generation of Navitimer fans. So inside, we got the Caliber 17, which is essentially an ETA 2824-2 with decoration and modified with a custom rotor. Operates at 28,800 vibrations an hour. It has a 40-hour power reserve. It's a 26 joule movement. When pushed in all the way, we got manual wind. When pulled out to the first position, we have quick set on the date there. And then we pull it out all the way, you'll see the second hand has stopped. So we got... Uh, hacking as well. It is COSC certified, so performance is absolutely tip top as proudly displayed by Chronometer there. We have an applied B logo, the old school B logo, referencing this change in, in the brand's priorities and, and style back to more classic or the classic era of Breitling. We have interestingly a beaded edge to the bi-directional bezel there. It frames the domed crystal beautifully well. The domed crystal is extremely subtly domed. You hardly even notice it. It has AR coating on the inside. That dial is just absolutely bewitching. A really rich blue. It's a different blue to my Navi Time, as you can see. It's a bit more, well, it's somewhere between Egyptian blue and denim blue. Of course, we get that sunburst effect that is just absolutely gorgeous. Uh, mine is a little bit more kind of steel blue, I would say. Obviously, with the sunburst effect, you get so many different kind of variations. Sometimes it looks black, other times it, it's quite light. And accentuated by, obviously, the, the um, AR coating. They've kept the red tip on the second hand, and they've added the B logo instead of the, with the anchor. If I show you mine, there's, there's the anchor uh, onto the counter of the second hand. Baton hands with luminescence, no loom on the dial, which is a little bit disappointing, although we do have indices with a double marker at the 12 o'clock. The date is symmetrically and beautifully placed at the six o'clock, which is, yeah, that, that is a welcome change indeed. The date wheel has the matching darker blue with the crisp white for the lettering. And little flashes of red every so often on certain markings and the scales that complement that extremely precise tip of the second hand. The finishing is impeccable. Again, high, high mirror finish. No other uh, stars of finishing whatsoever. So let's pop it on the wrist and see how this little beauty wears. 
and there we go. So on my six and a quarter inch wrist, it is utter perfection. Uh, the way it plays with light, it has the majesty and grace and beauty of any Navi time. I mean, that dial is, despite being simplified, it's still um, as bewitching as any Navi timer. The edge of the bezel gives a slightly decorative um, and quite dressy feel, but at the same time, very easy and ergonomic to, to grip and use once on the wrist. It's astonishingly only 63 grams, so very, very light. Uh, certainly my sweet spot, and it's gonna be a sweet spot for a lot of people, I would imagine. Extremely comfortable. The strap has a very reassuring, luxurious feel to it and positions and holds the watch majestically. It's quite ravishing as you angle it and play with the light. Um, very legible as well, despite the markings being just that slight bit smaller than um, my uh, Navi timer. Yeah, very light. Yeah, you, you actually, <laughs> I've got to be honest, it's so slender, it feels much more like a dress watch than a tool watch. But that is something that the Navi Timer has always done so well. And that actually brings me on nicely to discussing the positives and negatives. So without a doubt, the first thing, you know, that, that I've got to praise is this more traditional size, shall we say. It really bridges the gap between dressy, sporty and tall wonderfully. Uh, it's quite refreshing to have a Navi Timer that's so slender. I mean, that is something that it's quite noticeable about my Valju 7750 based Navi there. It's classic look, it's tastefully done. The dial has that concave depth that is just so indicative of the Navi timer. It does evoke the feeling of a Navi timer, un unquestionably, despite the lack of chronograph. The qualities there, exquisitely made with COSC certification. If you have no qualms about it, um, um, its accuracy, also, it's going to be very easy and affordable to service with uh, the ETA in there and certainly more robust because obviously with just being a three-hander with the date, less complications, less complicated, uh, so less chance of things going wrong. So as a tool, it, it definitely serves its purpose. I think it's a clever idea to, to appeal to a wider audience. Part of the motivation for making this was not only to attract an audience uh, the Asian audience, but also the female wearer or watch fan. And it will certainly do that. I asked my wife what she thought. She loved it. She thought it was very refined looking. And that is something that the Navi Timer dial always does. It's a balanced, elegant look that is just so delightful to wear. So let's discuss the negatives uh, because, well, unfortunately, there's a lot of them. Now, Breitling brought out the Navi Timer 8 family of watches where they got rid of the scales uh, completely. I think the fact that they kept it here, um, it still feels like a Navi Timer. I think uh, the, the scales are so integral to the history of the watch that to have a Navi Timer without the scales, well, to me personally, it just doesn't feel like a Navi Timer. The loss of the uh, chronograph isn't actually that much of a, a big loss. I'm, I'm, I have to be honest. However, um, what would have really elevated this, this particular version would have been perhaps to replace the chronograph with a more usable complication. I would love to see a day complication or even a GMT. Uh, that would have really just taken this watch to that next level. It feels a little bit lacking. Purists will be up in arms of, uh, about the lack of chronograph, but let's not forget there was that reference 66, uh, which had no chronograph and had no scales even. Um, so it's not the first time Breitling have done this. One of the biggest negatives of this watch is definitely the water resistance being only 30 meters. I think they could have improved it. It's certainly the Achilles heel of the, of the Navi timer always has been. If we look back at the historic uh, cosmonaut that um, accompanied Carpenter on his space mission when he re-entered and he landed in water, there was actual water damage to the dial of the watch. 
and I'm always very nervous about wearing my navy timer, even on a rainy day, it would have been nice to see Breitling address this Achilles heel. The next big negative for me is the value. I mean, this is priced between three and four thousand dollars. Obviously, prices vary depending on where you buy it, how you buy it. But for that money, I mean, you might as well just get a used um, older version like mine, which is you can definitely buy on the used market for, for less than that. Not to mention the Zin, which if you remember the jewel with my Navi timer, uh, beat it because it had the decorated movement, more water resistant. It was actually a better watch in every single way. The only thing it didn't have is the branding. So it is undoubtedly overpriced in my opinion. Not on the preposterous levels of, of some IWCs. I just think it could have been a little bit more affordable. At the end of the day, if you want to attract a new Breitling owner, this could have really spoken to a lot more people had it been more attainable. My last negative is just a minor one. There's no loom on the dial to give it orientation, which is a bit of a shame. Even those tiny loom markings on my Navi, this is actually fairly legible at night and having a double marker at the 12 also gives it orientation. So yeah, it's a bit of a shame it has no loom, but I understand that they're taking it more in a dressy direction. Having said that, if this does it for you, you're certainly gonna enjoy it. You do feel the link to that incredible uh, legacy and heritage that makes the Navi timer just so compelling and pleasing watch to wear. The romance of that age, it, comes through in the watch without a shadow of a doubt. I guess the big question for me is, would I actually buy one? Well, you know, I part of the allure of the, the, the Navi time, it has to be that chronograph. Um, and also I'm a sucker for the winged logo. Uh, so for me, I'd always go used Navi timer. So really, really mixed feelings on this. Uh, equally a, a pleasure to wear and a disappointment. I, I, I've i never been so um, torn by a watch. I mean, it's the most lovable disappointment <laughs> I've ever encountered. So yeah, I just, I just don't know what to make of it. But anyway, um, but in conclusion, I have to say I am excited where Breitling is going. I don't think it's the uh, all doom and gloom that some people are making out the, the, the changes are to the brand. I, I think it's long overdue. I'm happy to see this, then another oversized gargantuan monstrosity. The brand is going in the right direction, but it's not quite there yet. Anyway, guys, I'm gonna leave it there. Uh, again, massive thank you to Moya Jewelers. Uh, I'll leave a link in the description. Please don't forget to add your thoughts, queries, comments, opinions, all the rest of it down below. Thank you so much for watching. Please don't forget to like this video if you enjoyed it and found it useful. And as always, guys, I will catch you in the next one. Okay, ciao. This is a public service reminder for the good gentry. Please follow us on Instagram, join the Facebook UGWC group, and click on the bell to keep notified of new videos. Don't forget to keep it positive, keep it gentry, onwards and upwards. Thank you.